Our first scripture lesson today is from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus. I have heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints. And for this reason, I do not cease to give thanks for you as I remember you in my prayers. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and revelation as you come to know him so that, with the eyes of your heart enlightened, you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance among the saints, and what is the immeasurable greatness of his power for us who believe, according to the working of his great power. God put this power to work in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, Far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the age to come. And he has put all things under his feet and has made him the head over all things for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Our gospel lesson this morning comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter 14, beginning at verse 13. Listen again for God speaking to you. Now when Jesus heard this, that is, that John the Baptist was dead, he withdrew from there in a boat to a deserted place by himself. But when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns when he went ashore, he saw a great crowd, and he had compassion for them and cured their sick. When it was evening, the disciples came to him and said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away so that they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, bring them here to me. Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, 12 baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. This is the word of the Lord. The story I'm about to tell you is true. My Thanksgiving week started out great. Our children were all here and we had just gotten to downtown Dallas to start our fun on Tuesday when we got the call. Our yard service called to say that our fire pit and all the little rocks in it were now in our pool. That was interesting because our fire pit was not near our pool when we left home that morning. And the call wasn't, we're sorry, or we'll get it out. It was just, it's there. You better come home, they warned. We had one day for fun with our immediate family, and my husband was not going to let them ruin it. It takes a lot to get Jack Davenport mad. But he got mad. On Wednesday, my whole extended family showed up, and as usual... Mm, controversial topic came up in conversation about which we are sorely divided. Maybe you can help me prove that I am right. Does pineapple belong on pizza? All who say yes, raise your hand. Mm. Oatmeal raisin cookies, yes, raise your hand. What does turning up the AC do? All who thinks it makes it warmer, raise your hand. A 
few. Very good. Who prefers print books to e-books? Ooh, that's interesting. Who prefers a live Christmas tree to an artificial one? Prefers. A live tree. All right, that's interesting. It, raise your hand if you think it's okay to re-gift. Oh, yeah. You have to. That's almost unanimous. Who prefers canned cranberry sauce? Ooh, that's interesting. All right, and the most controversial at our table Wednesday night is Bigfoot Real. Who says yes? <laughs> All right, I know who you are now, yes. Well, y'all are as mixed up as my family. On Thursday, the weather was warmer than I anticipated, ruling out my planned Thanksgiving outfit, and I had nothing, I mean nothing, to wear Nothing. <laughs> the turkey wasn't great. We had way too many people in my house. We were crammed in like sardine. Sardine. Sixteen of us plus three dogs. We ate too much. My fantasy football players underperformed. <laughs> and two of my best wine glasses were broken. By the end of Friday... I was exhausted. I had spent the day cleaning up the big mess all these people made and then found out that several of our members had gotten the gift card scam via text or email. Come on, God. I needed a break. I needed an easy week for once. Thanks for nothing. Of course, the above is also trivial. Ann Voskamp lost her two-year-old little sister, Amy, in a farming accident. Ann reports that with the laying of her gravestone, the closing of her deathbed so closed our lives, closed to any notion of grace. The questions were never asked out loud. Can there be a good God, a God who graces us with good gifts when a crib lies empty through long nights? Where is God, really? How can he be good when babies die and marriages implode and dreams blow away, dust in the wind? Where is grace bestowed when cancer gnaws and loneliness aches? Her family came to the conclusion that there was no benevolent being, no grace, no meaning at all. It was rarely said. But these aren't things you need to say always. Like all beliefs and rights, you simply live them. We did. No, God. No, God. No, God, we won't take what you give. No, God, your plans are a glutted bleeding mess, and I didn't sign up for this, and you really thought I'd go for this? No, God, this is ugly, and you can't get anything right, and just haul all this pain out of here, and I'll take it from here. Thanks, and God, thanks for nothing. I understand how her family came to that place after the hardest loss one can imagine. Have you ever noticed that ingratitude is the original sin? Adam and Eve knew the creator of all. They hung out together. God gave them everything, everything they needed. God gave them remarkable freedom, expansive but not boundless. One thing God asked of the people God created, don't eat of just one tree. Enjoy the thousands, millions of plants I have given you. Just leave this one alone. It will kill you, God warned. So what happened? Ann Voskamp explains it this way. Adam and Eve were simply painfully ungrateful for all God gave. 
our fall was, has always been, and always will be, that we aren't satisfied in God and what God gives. We hunger for something more, something other. We believed the serpent's hissing lie, the repeating refrain of his campaign through the ages. God isn't good. That's the cornerstone of our enemy's movement. That God withholds good from his children. That God does not genuinely, fully love us. Doubting God's goodness, distrusting his intent, discontented with what he's given, we desire more. The whole rest of the garden is not enough. It will never be enough. The biggest temptation we have is to ungrateful. If you read the newsletter or Facebook post this week, you know the damage ingratitude does is extensive, leading to the death of who we were meant to be. It builds resentment in our hearts and blocks the Holy Spirit's work within us. It replaces faith, hope, and love with fear, doubt, and rivalry. Ingratitude makes us cling to negative feelings and exhausts us. Gratitude, on the other hand, opens us to new possibilities and replaces fatigue with vitality and enthusiasm. Our gospel reading for today is a familiar one. It's familiar because it's important. All four gospel writers include it. It's been beloved by the church from its origins until now because it's quite a miracle 5,000 men plus women and children with them are fed until full by just five loaves and two fish. This miracle not only meets the physical needs of those listening to Jesus teach, but it's also rich with theological themes. It evokes the memory of manna in the wilderness. It's a response to the appeal, give us this day our daily bread that Jesus taught us. It reveals the compassion of Jesus. It calls all disciples to faith. As familiar as I am with this story and as many times as I have read it and preached it, for 20 years I missed a crucial detail. The disciples reported that they had nothing. Nothing but five loaves and two fish. The disciples' mistake is often our mistake because we don't have everything. We think we have nothing. But we have a God who created the universe out of nothing. We have a God who can put flesh on dry bones, nothing. Put life in a dusty womb, nothing. Nothing is God's favorite material to work with. Perhaps God looks at what we dismiss as nothing, worthless, or insignificant, and says, Ha, now I can do something with that. When there is nothing, or close to it, is when we really get to see God work. After the report that they had nothing, or what might as well have been nothing, Jesus looked up to heaven, and then he blesses the loaves. This is not some kind of magic ritual in which Jesus imparts to the bread a quality it did not previously have. The blessing of the loaves is an expression of praise and thanksgiving to God. It's not so much the bread that is being blessed here. It is God, the giver of the bread. Jesus is thankful for what he has. As little as it looks, as impossible as it seems that this will meet the crowd's needs, Jesus thanks God for the gift of nothing but five loaves and two fish. Somehow, Some way, 
After Jesus gave thanks to God for what appeared not to be enough, approximately 15,000 people were fed, and there were 12 baskets of leftovers. Thanksgiving comes before the miracle. In our minds, we think it should be the opposite, right? God, give me exactly what I want, everything I think I need, and then I'll say thank you, maybe. But by then, will I want or need something more? By then, will I believe my own brains and effort brought it about? By then, will I take what I have for granted and never look up to heaven? Never say thank you to God. In Matthew 11, Jesus receives complaint after complaint. And then Jesus, in the face of apparent failure, when no one responded to his teaching and things didn't work out at all, after that, he said, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to infants. He gave thanks that he was unsuccessful. And the miracle is that his very next statement was one of great compassion. Instead of shazamming them, he offers the most beautiful invitation in scripture. Come to me, all who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens and I will give you rest. What do I do when I'm unsuccessful? I plead the fifth. We see it again at the death of one of his closest friends. Jesus stood outside Lazarus' tomb, tears streaming down his face, and he looked up and prayed, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. And then the miracle of a dead man rising. Thanksgiving came first. And then the mind-blowing miracle. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took bread. And he gave thanks to God for it. On the night before, he knew that the most excruciating physical, emotional, and spiritual pain a human can experience on this earth was coming. He receives what God offers as grace. He gives thanks for a simple piece of bread. The root word of what we celebrate at this table means grace. Eucharisteo, thanksgiving also holds its derivative, the Greek word chara, meaning joy. Is that the answer? Anne Voskamp wonders. Deep chara joy is found only at the table of Eucharisteo, only at the table of thanksgiving. So then, as long as thanks is possible, joy is always possible. Is that the miracle Thanksgiving brings? The deep joy for which all humans long. The truth is, we never have nothing. If Jesus Christ is Lord, and he is King of kings and Lord of lords, And as Paul wrote, we may come to know God and the glorious hope to which God has called us. We have an inheritance waiting for us and God's great power working on our behalf now. And let's not forget, we have each other. In this week that we gathered around tables with family and friends for a national holiday, let us remember that it goes beyond one day or one week. 
Thanksgiving is necessary to live the fullest life, the abundant life that Jesus came to show us and give us. It's not a forced optimism underlying the admonition to count your blessings. It's not a denial of real pain and loss. It isn't the power of positive thinking. We cannot attain a state of gratitude by presenting God's God with a list of things we think we should be thankful for. We look up to heaven and we realize that everything is a gift from God who loves us and gave himself for us. So we say thank you. Yes, even for the hard things, even for the difficult people, even for the failures. If we can really do this, our joy will explode and miracles will occur. Thanksgiving always comes before the miracle. So looking back over my week, I'm so very thankful for a home with a pool for a fire pit to end up in. That was always my childhood dream. For family coming to visit and our lively, hilarious discussion. For a crowded table with family and friends. For dogs to pet and love. For food in abundance. For church family with whom to pray and serve, rejoice and give thanks. For Canadian bacon and pineapple pizza. For Jesus. My maker, defender, redeemer, and friend. Gratitude is more than an occasional thanks be to God. It's living life with eyes wide open to every single good thing and the abundance of them that God has given us to enjoy. Let us pray. Great and wonderful God, I thank you for bringing so much out of nothing or what I perceive as nothing. Thanks for nothing and the promise it always brings. Amen.